wonderful conference and for inviting me. Uh, so I'm afraid you will hear a little bit more of the same. So my talk is also about the external challenge to conceptual engineering. And I guess there will be some overlap in how I develop the challenge. But then my way to address it will be very different. So I hope you won't be bored. Okay, so I'll make this quick. This is a very brief introduction to the topic of the talk. So here's a very sort of simplified working definition of conceptual engineering, which I understand in the re-engineering sense. So this is not about de novo engineering, but about conceptual engineering in, in Herman's sense of the term. So uh, I, I take this to be a method which aims at changing the meaning or reference of certain representational devices. And I say representational devices because I want to leave open if it's ultimately about concepts or about words. Uh, but this said, I mostly speak about word meanings in this, in this talk, uh, kind of leaving open how much of it applies also to conceptual change. Um, Okay, now semantic externalism very roughly <coughs> says that meanings of representational devices in general uh, are partly determined by factors that are external to the mind of speakers. And for oh, sorry, put the wrong button. <laughs> and so, for example, those include causal histories of the terms um, or microphysical structures of things in, in our environment uh, or the belief of experts, right? And now the question that I want to address in this talk is do we have control over these factors? And it seems because it seems that if we don't, um, then the concept of engineering might turn out to be a very difficult or a close to impossible thing. And this is what I call the external challenge to conceptual engineering. So the plan for this talk is first uh, to sort of unpack the external challenge in a bit more detail, to construct it as an argument with a number of premises and a conclusion, uh, and then to lay out one strategy to defend uh, conceptual engineering against the external challenge which is to say that conceptual engineering uh, can come without externalism. Uh, so I, I'll show that this strategy can be implemented in a number of ways. Uh, sorry, again, the wrong button. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> then I'll look at, two, uh, look at a second strategy, uh, which says that we can have conceptual engineering without actually possessing meaning control. And I take uh, a Herman to be uh, a, a, a proponent of this strategy. And then ultimately, I will lay out a, a third strategy, which is the one that I suggest uh, we, should, we should take, which says that you can have externalism with meaning control. And so you can have conceptual engineering with externalism because externalism doesn't uh, actually preclude meaning control. Okay, so let's get into the challenge. So first, very briefly, internalism and externalism. I just leave it with the externalism bit because we, I guess we'll be short on time. So externalism says that facts about the meanings of a linguistic expression E of a speaker S are not entirely, entirely grounded in facts about the mental states of that speaker. At least some of them are at least partly grounded in facts external to the mind of S. And you could also phrase that in terms of supervenience instead of grounding uh, if you prefer that. Okay, now here are two sort of skeptical conjectures about the relation between externalism uh, and conceptual engineering. So the first one says that if at least certain branches of externalism are true, then the means that philosophers who engage in conceptual engineering uh, have at their disposal uh, are ineffective in actually changing the meaning of an expression. And here's the rationale for why that conjecture seems plausible. So here's just some typical means that philosophers have at their disposal. They can write papers about conceptual engineering projects or even write books about them or they give talks like we do at, uh, at this conference, or they can teach seminars about it. Now we can suppose that some particular conceptual engineer is maximally convincing in his paper or talk or whatever. So we can even suppose that from now on everybody is convinced uh, that the conceptual engineering proposal is a good one, and so that all speakers uh, intend to use the expression with the meaning that the conceptual engineer suggested. And after a while, these, these speakers might even come to believe that the expression actually has the new meaning. So it seems that, very roughly, that it seems that on internalism, this kind of activism pays off. Because if everybody comes to believe or comes to intend that the expression has the, the new revised meaning, then this will make it the case that the expression actually has the new meaning. But on externalism, it might turn out that this whole activism is a big waste of time. Because believing or intending and so on, uh, the expression to have that new meaning just doesn't make it the case. Right? It, it just might turn out that it doesn't have this meaning. Okay, now here's a second skeptical conjecture about externalism and conceptual engineering. If certain branches of externalism are true, then changing the meaning of an expression is either impossible or at least very hard to achieve. Again, why is that so? So for example, on causal theories of reference, the current reference is grounded in facts about the past, 
and we simply cannot change the past. Uh, and also on classic natural kind externalism, which of course is linked to the causal theory of reference, uh, membership to a kind is partly determined by sameness of essential properties. And we just cannot change what the essential properties uh, of, of things are. So, sorry. Okay, so again, it takes us to be uh, a rational for uh, 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 that suggests a skeptical conjecture about externalism and conceptual engineering. So taking these conjectures and formulating a, 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 a sort of negative argument against conceptual engineering might look as follows. So first promise, first premise, a semantic externalism is true about many of our representational devices, and in particular about those representational devices typically in the focus of practitioners of conceptual engineering. Second premise, if semantic externalism is true about a given device D, then it is not within our control to change the meaning of D. Third, if it's not within our control to change the meaning of D, then conceptual engineering is not applicable to D. And it follows from this that conceptual engineering is not applicable to many of our representational devices, and in particular, it is not applicable to those representational devices typically in the focus of practitioners of conceptual engineering. You will so soon hear why I made this qualification in the first premise and in the conclusion. Okay, so here are just some brief comments about this way of framing the argument. So first you might wonder, what are the representational devices typically in the focus of conceptual engineering? And what does it mean to be with within our control? Uh, both of these questions will be tackled as we go along, so I won't say that here. Uh, the second comment, what does it mean for conceptual engineering to be not applicable to a given case? What does this not applicable mean? So I've, I've chosen this formulation because, because it is vague. Uh, and I think it could, here are some things it could mean. It could mean impossible if you have a very strong reading of the externalist challenge. But it could also mean something like undoable or something that philosophers shouldn't engage in or people in general shouldn't engage in uh, or that is not a good philosophical method or something like that. So the idea is that the externalist challenge establishes some kind of negative verdict about conceptual engineering, but it leaves open what exactly this kind of challenge uh, amounts to. Okay, so this way of uh, phrasing the argument gives rise to three straightforward strategies to defend conceptual engin engineering against it. The first one is to argue against premise one, that externalism does not hold for typical targets of conceptual engineers. The second strategy is to argue against premise three, that conceptual engineering does not require meaning control. And the third one is to argue against the second premise that externalism does not preclude meaning control. And now I will tackle those strategies in turn. Okay, so first one, strategy, first strategy, conceptual engineering without externalism. Okay, so I think there are at least two versions of this strategy. The first one is just to reject externalism altogether. And the second one is to grant externalism for certain semantic types but then argue that the typical objects of conceptual engineers uh, are just not among them. Okay, so I will not um, engage in the first strategy uh, for two reasons. So for one, I just share basic externalist intuitions. But also I think externalism is popular enough these days uh, to make its compatibility with uh, conceptual engineering just a very pressing and a vibrant um, methodological issue. Okay, so look, let's look at strategy B. Why could you think that the scope of externalism is limited? So first, you might think that Kripke's original uh, wording of the causal theory of reference from naming and necessity is limited to proper names in natural kind terms, such as water, gold, or tiger. And also Putnam's famous twin house argument from uh, the meaning of meaning also applies only to natural kind terms. At least you might think so. And this, these are, of course, distinctive because for one, they can be picked out by paradigm examples, and also their kind of is fixed by a posteriori or necessities. So then you might think, then you might look at recent proposals in conceptual engineering, which have been advanced in the literature, truth, uh, woman, black, knowledge, belief, or freedom of will. It seems that none of these are either proper names or natural kind terms. So you might think that, okay, why should we worry about causal series of reference if, if these are just not about the things that conceptual engineers uh, typically try to change? Okay, so here are some reasons for doubting that this works as a general strategy. First, it seems that some entries on the list I've just provided you with uh, might actually turn out to be natural kind terms. So for example, this has been suggested about knowledge by Hilary Combes or about belief by Clark and Chalmers. Sorry, this is Herman's reading of your, 
of your uh, uh, of your paper. But you can just stick to with knowledge as an example. Um, so it's not prima facie clear why natural kind terms shouldn't be engineered, right? If those turn out to be natural kind terms and people still think we, we should engineer them, then I mean it, it at least requires another argument to say that you can't change or that you shouldn't change natural kind terms. And another reason for doubting it is that external, which I take to be the more uh, important reason actually, is that externalism plausibly stretches beyond natural kind terms. So Putnam raised this issue already in the meaning of meaning. He uses pencil, table, and chair as examples. But I think the more important um, version here comes from, Sally, from Sally's recent work. So here's a quote from her, from her book, which is actually in the 2006 paper, I think. She says that uh, an externalist bias towards the natural science is not warranted for social kinds are no less real for being social. And the alternative she suggests is objective type externalism, which in a way um, generalizes the basic externalist insights also to social kinds. So this is the reason why you should, you should think that externalism is very, very relevant to conceptual engineering. OK, so I'll leave it with that. And now we'll come to strategy two, to have conceptual engineering without meaning control, which I take to be a Herman Capellan's view. So here's a very brief a summary of Herman's view from, from his recent book. He has this view called uh, inscrutable lack of control will keep trying. Uh, it says the processes involved in conceptual engineering are for the most part inscrutable and we lack control of them, but nonetheless we will and should keep trying. So just to flesh out what lack of control means, the process of conceptual engineering is governed by factors that are not within our control no one of us and no subgroup of us has any significant degree of control over how meaning change happens. And now the keep trying bit. So I'll, I'll leave the inscrutable part outside the picture because it's not so relevant for my purposes. So the keep trying thesis says that despite inscrutable and lack of control, we will and most importantly should uh, keep trying to engage in conceptual engineering. And given the kinds of creatures we are, maybe we must keep trying. So I'll focus on the should part. OK, I think there's at least a prima facie tension between the two elements of the view, the should keep trying bit and the lack of control bit. And uh, one way to articulate this tension is this. Assume that, um, first premise, we ought to engage in conceptual engineering only if conceptual re revisions can be implemented. Second premise, if we do not possess meaning control, then conceptual re revisions cannot be implemented. Third, we do not possess meaning control and therefore conceptual re revisions cannot be implemented. And so it is not the case that we ought to engage in conceptual engineering. OK, so I note that premise three, the lack of control thesis, is not based on, on some contingent factors that we don't try hard enough, or that we should learn how to do it, or something like that. But it's based on principled meta-semantic reasons. OK, so I guess the most important premise in this argument, which is probably the one that Herman would disagree with. This is the, the first one that says we ought to engage in conceptual engineering only if conceptual revisions can be implemented. So why can't we just theorize about better concepts without trying to implement any changes? You might think. So I think there are two different claims to defend here. The first one is a very strong claim that I think is true, but I won't defend here. This says that conceptual engineering without implementation is just generally useless. Right? If it turns out that implementations cannot be made, then conceptual engineering is just a big waste of time. We shouldn't do it. But there's also a weaker claim in the vicinity. And this, this says that there's at least a significant share of conceptual engineering projects, which do actually depend on, its, uh, on them being implemented. And there's some evidence that at least this weaker claim is true, because some conceptual engineering projects regard conceptual amelioration or revision uh, precisely as a means to social change. And for those projects, it will be very important that the changes proposed are actually taken up and implemented, because only then the, the, so, the social change in question can be achieved. And here's, for example, a quote from Mark Richard's um, paper and, uh, and a description about the A project, which is very much in the spirit that I just suggested. He says that the A project, by which he means the ameliorative project, uh, will be successfully carried off only if a large number of those who think about the world using C, expressing those thoughts with word W, come to do something we might call changing the concept C in ways that reflect the revisionary analysis while continuing to use W to express their revised concept C. 
Okay, so at least I have a companion in guilt uh, for this, at least for this weaker claim. Okay, so Herman sort of uh, anticipates this kind of objection in his book um, and treats it. So, um, yeah, I think I'll just read the, the whole quote for you because it, it makes sense <laughs> to have it in mind. Okay, so here's what he says. He says, some readers of early drafts of this manuscript found it weird that I presented as a defense of the importance of conceptual engineering, but at the same time defense thesis like lack of control and scrutable will keep trying. They asked whether this book is in effect a debunking project disguised misleadingly as a defense and whether this book is in effect an extended argument that conceptual engineering is impossible. I understand this reaction, but it's a mistake that the processes underlying change are inscrutable and uncontrollable is a familiar point from other normative domains. Theorists are comfortable reflecting on and proposing theories of justice, for example, without having a recipe um, for how they can be implemented. More generally, we can make judgments about what ought to be the case without knowing how to make the world that way, or even having a plausible strategy in mind. Those are just different projects, figuring out what ought to be the case and making the world that way. Okay, so. Here are some problems with this view. So, for one, I think it is true that the value of normative theories does not generally depend on detailed knowledge about how to implement them. I grant that. But at the same time, I think that there's an important difference between, on the one hand, pro proposing theories while not having any clue as to how they can be implemented, and on the other hand, proposing theories while knowing that they cannot be implemented. And I think the situation that we are facing here is the situation of type B and not the situation of type A. And uh, although I do think that a situation of type A is at least to some extent um, unproblematic, I think a situation of type B isn't. Uh, and also the literature uh, about ideal theorizing and non-ideal theorizing, I think, is full of examples where philosophers have deep concerns about situations of type B. Right? I put, just put some, uh, made some references to some people who think that too. Okay, so I leave it with that, and now come to the third strategy, which I think is the, the one we should endorse, uh, which tries to see if externalism is not, after all, compatible with meaning control. And just as a very quick uh, preview of what I do in this last section, I'll first uh, distinguish between different varieties of control, uh, and in particular I will introduce the notion of collective long-range control, and I'll also argue that collective long-range control typically suffices, so by typically I mean in other cases than conceptual engineering, uh, suffices to motivate normative projects. And then I'll argue that accidental reference change actually happens, and I'll show that although Kripke's original version of the causal theory of reference has some problems to make sense of it, um, revised, some revised versions of the causal theory, in particular by Gareth Evans and Michael David, can make sense of reference change. And then lastly, I'll argue that the mechanisms endorsed by Gareth Evans and by Michael David uh, can be implied intentionally and are within our collective long-range control. And so this will give me the, the conclusion that uh, <coughs> conceptual engineering is not undermined as a normative project. Okay, so very briefly about varieties of control. I think there is an important distinction between immediate control and long-range control. Don't, please don't press me too much on the precise wordings of these definitions. I'm sure there are counterexamples. I was just trying to... Uh, and I think I will succeed to get to some intuitive sense of a distinction here. So the first um, immediate control, as I phrased it here, says that the subject has immediate control over some condition if and only if there is a single uninterrupted action that the subject can take and that will, with a sufficient degree of likelihood, have C as a consequence. Right? And examples for this are raising my arm or turning on the light switch or stuff like that. Things I can just do straight away. But then there's also a notion of long-range control, and to have that, a subject must have, um, that there must be a series of potentially interrupted actions which can be performed over a significant period of time and uh, which the subject can take and which will, again, with a sufficient degree of likelihood, uh, have C as a consequence, right? And, uh, of course, the sufficient degree of likelihood is a bit vague, but I think that will do for our purposes. And some examples are reducing one's body weight. I can't do that straight away, at least not in a healthy way. Uh, or to, uh, to reduce one's cholesterol concentration, blood pressure, things like that. Or change one's behavioral dispositions, etc. I think there is a sense in which I'm in control of these things, although there's nothing I can do that will change them straight away. Okay, another <coughs> distinction here is to take immediate and long-range control and apply them to collectives. 
So this will give you collective immediate control. I'll not read it because I won't endorse it. An example for this, in my view, would be elections. So there, there is a single action for each agent that they can take this and, and which will make it the case that a certain party wins an election. And then the important sense from, for my purposes is collective long-range control. And according to this, a group G has long-range control over some condition C if and only if there's a set of series of in, un, sorry, interrupted actions to be performed again over a significant period of time which sufficiently many members of that group can take and which will, with a sufficient degree of likelihood, have C as a consequence. Okay, examples for this, I think, are reducing the emission of greenhouse gases to, to a certain degree, or reducing world poverty, or all these kinds of long-term projects. Um, so, there's no individual who can do that, and no collective can do it immediately, but a collective can do it over a significant period of time. Okay, and um, as I think these examples already show, I think collective long-range control is generally sufficient to motivate normative projects. So I haven't heard anybody argue that we shouldn't try to reduce greenhouse gases just because it takes a collective to do that or to, and to do it over a longer period of time. So it seems that collective long-range control is generally sufficient. If the normative project is important, then it's not, uh, it, its value is not undermined simply because we only have collective long-range control. And here's a quote from the UN about the sustainable development, development goals that's just supposed to prove this point. So they write on their website that each of the sustainable development goals has specific targets to be achieved over the next 15 years. And they also say that for these goals to be reached, everyone needs to do their part, governments, the private sector, and civil society. And I think the, the first one, the bit over the next 15 years, shows that the uh, notion of control in place here is long range. And um, the quote that everybody has to play their part shows that it's collective. Okay, so if you agree that the sustainable development goals are important normative goals, um, then I think you have to agree that collective long-range control is typically um, sufficient to, to, to have a worthwhile normative project. Okay, now to the second part of the third section, reference change. Here's just a fictional example of uh, reference change. Um, maybe it would be better to have a real example, but a, a real-life example, but those are typically disputed and there are lots of different uh, interpretations going on, so I chose uh, a fictional example here. So the first vignette, Young Mary on Twin Earths. So just as in uh, Putnam's original case, suppose that we are back in 1750, uh, when people had very little knowledge of chemistry, and then elsewhere in the galaxy, there's a planet which is exactly like uh, Earth in all respects, except that the watery stuff that fills the oceans there, uh, and the rivers and the lakes, is not composed of H2O, but of, but of XYZ, say and that's called this planet Twin Earths. And now suppose that some Earthians built a spaceship and traveled to Twin Earths after landing on Twin Earths. Mary, who is one of the space travelers, um, quickly recognized the planet's resemblance with Earth. And when the crew reaches the shore of what appears to be a great lake, she says to one of her crew members, unbelievable, there's even water on this planet. OK, fair enough. Compare this to the second vignette, old Mary on Twin Earths. So now suppose that Mary and some of the other crew members decide to permanently settle on Twin Earths. And as time progresses, more and more Earthians do the same. All of them do all the stuff with Twin Water that normal Earthians do with water. They drink it, shower with it, swim in it, etc. None of them is aware of any difference between water and Twin Water. They all keep calling Twin Water water. Towards the end of her long life that she has spent mostly on Twin Earths, Mary goes back to the same shore she and her crew found right after landing on Twin Earths and mumbles to herself, there's so much water here, I still remember how excited I was when I first saw it. Okay, so here are what I take to be the intuitive verdicts uh, about these cases. I think in the Young Mary case, uh, water refers to water, not to twin water. And um, this is why her utterance that there is water on twin earth is false. But then in the old Mary case, I think that water actually refers to twin water. And so her utterance is true. And if you agree that these are uh, the intuitive verdicts about these cases, then this implies that there is some point in time between the old, uh, between the young Mary case and the old Mary case where water switch reference from H2O to XYZ. Okay, now let's look at how causal series of reference can accommodate reference change. So I think there's a problem here that about Kripke's original statement of the causal theory. Um, it seems that he cannot accommodate at least the second of the verdicts, the one about the old Mary case. 
And this is because for him, an initial baptism plus the speaker's intention to use the term exactly as it was passed on to her is sufficient for reference preservation. And we may suppose that in the old Mary case, Mary has the intention to use the term exactly as it was passed on to her, because nobody on Twin Earth is aware that there has been a change. So it seems that Kripke would have to say that even old Mary still refers to water and not to um, twin water. Okay, so here's how Gareth uh, Evans diagnosed uh, what went wrong in Kripke's theory. He says that Kripke has mislocated the, cause, the important causal relation because the one that matters lies between the items, uh, lies between the, that item states and doings and the speakers of body information as opposed to the items being dubbed with the name and the speaker's contemporary use of it. So in his, what we might call hybrid theory, there's a body of information that people associate with the term. Um, and this body of information has to stand in the right sort of relation uh, with the item to be, for that item to be its reference. Okay, so here's just how, how uh, Evans sums up his own view. He says the reference of a proper name but that might also extend to natural kind terms in the usual way. Uh, as used by a speaker, is the source of causal origin of the body of information that S has associated with the name. And similarly, Michael David uh, has a view according to which the reference of a proper name as used by a speaker is the object that grounds those thoughts of the speaker which suppose S to use the name. Okay, so um, I think both of these views can uh, make much better sense of reference change, just quickly, how this looks like on, on David's account. So it's plausible that terms have multiple groundings, not just one, uh, and those might potentially involve different kinds of objects. And now it might happen that over time new groundings are required and old groundings fade, because the idea is also that if a grounding is not actualized uh, after a while, then it will fade from the causal source, um, whereas new groundings can be acquired. And now it just might happen that sufficiently many groundings of a term uh, which involve an object of a kind K1 are lost, and sufficiently many which involve uh, the kind K2 are required, and then as a result reference changes from kind K1 to kind K2. Okay, I can leave this out. Okay, and similarly for David, uh, sorry, for, for Evans, um, on his view, different pieces of information which a speaker associates with the term might have different causal origins, and those again might uh, involve different objects, and over time it might happen that new pieces of information are acquired and old pieces are lost. And again, if sufficiently many of the right pieces of information are acquired, which are grounded in a new kind K2, then reference of T might switch from K1 to K2. Okay, well, um, one important qualification for his view is not to speak of a causal source, uh, uh, but to speak of a dominant causal source. So if you admit that there are different causal sources, then what matters for reference fixing is what is the dominant causal source. Okay, so I think both Evans and David's view can make much better sense of the intuitive verdicts about the young Mary and the old Mary case in the following sense. So for the young Mary case, it's plausible that uh, all, or at least by far the most, pieces of information that the speakers and twin owners associate with water have water as their causal origin, or as a uh, David would say, are grounded in water. And so this will make it the case that Mary refers to water and hence her utterance is false. But on, in the old Mary case, uh, Mary has lived on twin earths for a long while, and so all her direct and indirect contact with watery stuff involved twin water, at least as, as, as long as she lives there. And by now, because the example is traced towards the end of her life, uh, most pieces of the information that Mary associates with water actually have twin water as their causal source. Uh, and so she refers to twin water, and hence her utterance is true. Okay, so now lastly, let's get to the question of how this uh, kind of mechanism can be employed uh, intentionally. What would that mean? To have intentional reference change modeled on causal series, it would mean to switch reference of a term from a kind K1 to a kind K2. And to do that, we have to make it the case that K2 becomes the dominant causal source of origin of the information we associate with T. How can we do that? Well, first we can use the term to communicate information about K2 instead of K1. This will influence the causal source of T for us and also for those who hear us. Also, we can stop using the term in question to communicate <coughs> information about the former kind, K1. Um, if kind K K1 is not uh, regrounded, uh, then K1 will fade from the causal source which is associated with T. And both these things will contribute to changing 
uh, first of all, the body of information that people associate with the term in question, and also what causally grounds these information. So in the case of water, there's probably not so much change of information because the, the people on twin are think that twin water and uh, water is the same. There's no, they don't have different beliefs about twin water than they used to have about water. But what changes here is, the co is what causally grounds this information. But where the two terms are not referring to something that is superficially identical, then also the body of information will change. Okay, so the last question, very briefly, do we possess control over these things? I think that there's typically no individual who is in control. This is because causal sources are transmitted via communication and speaker, speakers influence it, each other. So what, what you say will have an influence on what causally grounds the terms that you use for me and vice versa. And also I think even a, a whole linguistic community, at least on causal series of reference, has no direct control. And this is because updating and regrounding information is a long-term project. You can't just reground all, uh, uh, all your body of information in a second, at least not typically. But nonetheless, I think that over time, a linguistic community can make reference change happen. So we do at least possess, uh, possess collective long-range control. Uh, and as I've argued in other ethical cases, this kind of collective long-range control is sufficient to uh, pass the autumn implies can test. And so by parity of reasons, conceptual engineering does as well. OK, let me just wrap up. Uh, I've argued that conceptual engineering, or I've, I've just stated that conceptual engineering involves changing the meaning or reference of a term intentionally. But it seems that cryptic Putnam style externalism uh, implies that we do not possess a sufficient uh, amount of meaning control to do that. And then the first strategy I've looked at was to say that we can have conceptual engineering uh, without externalism. Uh, the problem I raised for this view was that it's unclear how far externalism reaches. It might turn out that it stands in the way of this strategy. Strategy, uh, strategy two was to have conceptual engineering without meaning control. Uh, very roughly, the problem I've raised for this view is that many conceptual engineering projects reply on it, sorry for the typo, uh, on its actual implementation. And the, the last strategy, the one I've ultimately endorsed, is that external, you can have externalism with meaning control, or at least with collective long-range control. And here the idea was that reference change is a fairly common phenomenon. I've given a vignette to show that. And Evans and David's respective versions of the causal theory can make sense of it. And the mechanism they suggest for, this, for reference change to happen uh, is within our collective long-range control. Okay, very briefly to some limitations so that you won't press them as objections against me. So there's an open question about how far the causal theory of reference actually reaches. I've not addressed this. And also the question is, can similar points be made about other variants of externalism? So I've only focused on causal theories of reference, but there's also social externalism or reference magnetism. I've left those out. But, um, but I do believe that we, you can make a similar point about those as well. So I've taken the causal theory of reference because I think it's the hardest case. But you can ask me about this in the Q&A. Okay, and there's of, of course the question, does conceptual engineering really always imply reference change? So it might, it, it might be that some important conceptual engineering projects do not actually uh, uh, involve reference change. And there's a question, those that don't re uh, imply reference change, uh, uh, can we, how can we make sense of them and do they allow us control as well? And lastly, just my view, the one presented here, support optimism about conceptual engineering. I think yes and no. So for one, conceptual engineering cannot be done from the armchair. With this, I, I completely agree with, with Herman's view also. Um, and I guess for this reason, thinking that philosophers have the power to bring about meaning change is mostly a uh, hubris. But nonetheless, I think there are no principled reasons not to try because we do, after all, possess collective long-range control. And in this, in this sense, I think conceptual engineering is very similar to other kinds of social change. Okay, thanks.
uh, principle. Um, your characterization of externalism was one which said meaning is determined by factors external to the mind. So there's some conceptions of mental content on which it's already and fundamentally external. It's a controversial view. I don't know if in this room didn't agree with that, but suppose we've got that conception. For example, certain uh, conceptions of perceptual content already without notice of distance, direction, that's an objective and external reference. When is perceptual content that's getting external reference um, determined? That's intrinsic to the mind. Um, there's not anything there. It's the operation of intentionality, action, judgment, rational reaction to information, or anything like that. Um, you, you've really got that just, just happening to you. So my question is, if, if you have this more externalist conception of mental content, are there corresponding limitations on the, the range of possible conceptual engineering? If somebody comes along and says, well, I've got a notion of distance and direction, so forth, which you're not perceiving distance and direction, it's just statements. We're just changing it. We have resistance to that that um, doesn't have analogs in the cases you quite rightly discussed from Evans and, and um, Maybe you'd like to just comment on that very general issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure if I, if I got that. Um, so is the, is the question how far the, the, the things I said about linguistic externalism sort of uh, 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 can be generalized to mental content externalism? Yeah, it sounds, uh, the formulation of issues made it sound like it was very much going along, was married to a, a narrow content view of uh, Yeah, yeah, content. yeah. And it's not obviously obligatory, and maybe the landscape looks very different. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't really know. So, so I've chosen to, um, yeah, to, to use a narrow content view because it, it's just way easier to phrase uh, semantic externalism with respect to language uh, in this sort of uh, in this sort of uh, frame. <coughs> um, but yeah, uh, for, so for the moment, I would just leave it as an open question of how, how you can make sense of mental content externalism in a, in a similar way. I'm not I'm not sure. Sorry. Empty. Yeah. Um, I think you're um, I just want to clarify something about the difference between strategies two and three, mm -hmm. as you presented them. So suppose I say, hey, I accept a principle inscrutable lack of control will keep trying. That sounds like a great principle to me. And you say, so isn't there a tension there? Why say will, should, or must keep trying if you've just said lack of control? And I say, oh, well, because when I said lack of control, I just meant lack of immediate control in the sense yeah. that you just put it. I mean, this seems plausible, right? Like we, you know, we lack like direct total control, yeah. as we say. We have something like collective long range control. And when I said should keep trying, in that third part of the principle that I articulated in my second strategy, um, yeah. I meant uh, something like a group engaging in uh, collective long range control. And clearly, it's fine to say that someone should or must keep trying to have like some sort of influence on something. Yeah. Is there then any difference between strategies two and three? No, that's that's exactly my view. Cool. But I think then it's an important clarification to say which kind, which which notion of control you endorse in which part of the view, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, so so ultimately, this is also a question for Herman, I guess, because I so, like that version. Cool. That was a good one. Yeah. Because yeah, so <laughs> so so at, at at one point in in, uh, in uh, uh, writing this writing this talk, I thought so. Maybe, maybe Herman agrees with all of what I say, but what I call collective long-range control, he would just call no control. <laughs> because, it, because, because it's so, so little of a control, it's maybe. It's conditional on the assumption you know, that Evans had the right, I have no clue that Evans is right. I don't, I mean, I don't even understand the view. There's a whole bunch of, part that I could get a whole bunch of people, all the speakers of English to coordinate on structuring their patches. The usage according to some Evans strategy for long-term change. Okay. That to me is like extraordinarily far out of control. So yeah. that, that certainly is a kind of, okay, of okay. control. Yeah. In my view. Yeah, so, so yeah, just to make that clear, I don't think that, that the whole linguistic community has to coordinate on changing their uh, linguistic behavior, right? So I think uh, as every utterance, is, uh, every utterance will influence the causal source, um, it, it can happen just by uh, aggregation, right? There's no, no need for an, uh, yeah, there's no group agency involved, not necessarily. Number three. I think I have three. Yeah, yeah, so I just want to ask, given what your understanding reference to be, why would anybody, uh, like, descriptively, does anybody actually want to change that? And then normatively, like, does anybody? So, like, here's a totally reasonable project that somebody might have. 
they might want to change the way that people think about trans women. So they want everybody to consider them to be fully women or whatever. To I totally get that project, right? Here's a way to satisfy that project that doesn't satisfy your project. We turn everybody into swamp men who get reconstructed by lightning and so have no causal relations to women, right? But they consider trans women fully women, or at least they're so made to act as if they thought that, right? Now that yeah. looks like a world where I got everything that I wanted out of this supposed consent engineering project, right? Everybody's doing what I wanted. Unfortunately, reference hasn't changed, right? Because the information in people's brain isn't causally regulated by uh, women in the right way. But who, who would care about that? Um, so like, do people care about that? And then why should we? Yeah, so, so for one, of course, that's a very uh, implausible externalist view about meaning. No, nobody would hold that view. Sorry, that, what? So this is the swamp men view about meaning. That's some modification. Sorry, so, so your view entails that swamp men don't refer to the things that intuitively they think about, right? Because they're ah, okay, that's, 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 that's okay. by the things in the world. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay. So, um, well, for, for one, I mean, I was addressing the externalist challenge and I was trying to diffuse the externalist challenge. So, so in a way, what you say, also what you said in your talk and what I say in, in my talk, uh, is totally complementary, right? It, it might be that there are various reasons not to, to worry about the externalist challenge so much. But I was trying to focus on the, what I take to be the, the hardest externalist challenge, which is the one um, that uh, raises concerns for conceptual engineering projects which actually try to switch reference. And I was trying to show that even, 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 even switching reference is possible, uh, um, and and if, if if that is not always what we want, uh, then that's so much the better for conceptual engineers, right? Was was that addressing the, the point? Well, just, but do you think anybody should try to change that? Uh, yeah. Changing that stuff. Yeah. So I, yeah, I mean. So, what is so well, for a number of reasons. So so first, I mean, you, you would want to change the truth conditions of utterances that that in, that involves the sentences in question, um, and 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 this is so this is one reason for why it matters. Um, he doesn't care about truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so a, that's a, yeah. Yeah, that's a whole different discussion. He's <coughs> also here to talk about his talk. We're going to go to number four. I'm four. Uh, so I wanted to ask about strategy too. Uh, and push on it in a different way. And so you say that you're kind of the situation where in the more like not said it's like really hard, but that cannot. And I just wanted to know like, what the relevant cannot here is. And I was thinking about this in the context of um, some of what Berman is saying. So one way of taking uh, Berman is there's a bunch of different normative and evaluative claims that people make in the context of doing conceptual engineering. Um, not all of those normative and evaluative claims have anything to do with like any optimism about potential implementation. Maybe certain normative claims uh, turn out that they, like they're undermined, like you really metaphysically cannot, in the relevant sense of cannot, such mm -hmm. that the often implies can principle of the kind that you think is right, is undermined. But for lots of other normative claims, or lots of other evaluative claims, it doesn't seem like uh, it's like cannot. And you, and then you cited like the um, ideal, non-ideal theory literature, but I would have thought one of the ways to go with that is just to say, well, you might have certain views about what you wanted from political philosophy, but one view in that literature is precisely like, look, some of the time when we're doing a certain kind of more idea, like theorizing political philosophy, we're theorizing about conditions that we're not in, that we have no hope of getting in anytime soon, that we think is metaphysically possible for agents like us to be in, but uh, it's not feasible anyway to get there anytime soon. We might never get there. And I, I guess I was thinking that that's, if that's like okay there, should be okay here. Yeah. yeah, so I suspect that it's not okay there. Okay. So, uh, so in political philosophy and especially in feminist philosophy, uh, feasibility constraints do matter a lot. So we've heard about uh, a bit about that in, in, in Sally's talk already. There's, there's lot of, lots of discussion about uh, that you should only engage in strategies which actually actually can can have an effect, and you, you should think about which strategies will be better than other ones, and and just just you know have this ut uh, utopian view about about uh, uh, categories in philosophical uh, in, in political philosophy or feminist philosophy will probably not uh, accord to that standard. But I said that would mean it's been a longer discussion. I guess it would mean for it not to be okay. I mean, I think there's a, I mean, sort of a pluralist about that. There's a lot of different projects people can engage in. Some of them are more interested in questions, say, like debates about climate change. Okay, where but your the conditions you're thinking about, feasibility is built in. But I guess I just would reject that. Like, there's any domain of normative value theorizing where like there's uh, they're not comprehensible. 
claims that might well worth be asking in certain circumstances that aren't tethered to that kind of feasibility. Yeah, okay, but, but would you not agree that at least some conceptual engineering projects uh, do rely on its actual implementation? So if you think that conceptual engineering is a means of social change, you want to change our society and you think that changing concepts is, a, is an important means to do that, then, I mean, it's very hard to square that view with the idea that you can't really implement those changes, right? Because they are means to, to social change, and how can you have your social change if you can't revise the concepts in question? Well, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I thought one way of thinking about an aspect of uh, what Herman is saying, not all of it, is that one of the things you might be interested in is slowly making those claims about the other part of the project. So in the same way that I might be interested in, uh, you know, what a fully just society might look like, um, but myself not be involved in trying to implement it, or think that I have very little chance of doing it, I still might think that's an interesting project to be engaged in. Maybe it's for more theoretical interests, but I guess I was thinking that yeah. the assumption that everyone who's thinking about these kinds of claims and wondering how to get there is going to be the success conditions for their activity are going to have to do with actual communication. Might be just saying the bar too high. It seems too yeah. high in other areas of normative value theorizing to me. And that's why it yeah. seems off to me here. Yeah, okay. So, so I've been trying to distinguish between uh, the, the two kinds of situations. So the one is where you don't have a clear recipe, and I agree that this is to some extent uh, okay. But the situation I thought we were in here is the one uh, where you have general reasons that, that say you can't revise concepts. And in, in, in that kind of situation, I think the, the interest in revising concepts would seriously be undermined. So maybe there's some intellectual curiosity, the world would be so good if truth meant this and that, and if, if uh, gender terms would change or something. But at least the interest in those projects would be seriously diminished. So maybe there's a bit of theoretical uh, curiosity that, that still uh, uh, supports engaging in those projects, but I think they would l lose a lot of significance, uh, at least. Well, well, yeah, that's me. Uh, so I, I was going to ask you if you could uh, clarify what you mean by implementing a, a change of meaning. So I was thinking about, like, yeah, views on uh, if we can successfully stipulate meanings. So say young Mary goes to this uh, the Queen Earth and she has some experience with the watery stuff there and she uh, sits down during her first evening there and she says to the people she's speaking with that gosh, I don't know if this has the chemical structure of the uh, uh, stuff we call water back home in Earth, but it, it, it works uh, in the same way. It functions for me like water because we drink it, so I'll just mm -hmm. call it water. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, suppose the people she's speaking with even goes along with her. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. We don't need to call something different. Let's, let's just call it water. Uh, so do you think that there uh, uh, that they don't succeed in uh, modifying the meaning of of the words there uh, of water in their context, and how does this scale yeah. up? Like, uh, couldn't you just think of implementing a new meaning, like limit your ambition that you don't have to change like what it means for the uh, linguistic community at large? Like every person who speaks English, I mean. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the relevant, so, so the community in question doesn't always have to be the whole linguistic community, but just a re sometimes just a relevant uh, subgroup of it. Uh, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, and so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what to think about those cases, but I, I think that, at least on first glance, a typical variant of the causal theory of reference would say that this is not possible. So they can stipulate however they want. This will not, at least not immediately, make it, make it the case that the term uh, refers differently. Um, and so, I mean, I mean, if 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 this is just a bad uh, a feature of causal series of reference, um, then so much the better for the externalist challenge. So maybe we can have sometimes, maybe we sometimes can have more than collective long-range control. I'm completely open to that. So I've been trying to argue that we have at least collective long-range control. So if it turns out that under some some circumstances, uh, a simple voting or people getting together and thinking, okay, let's use the term in this and this way. Maybe uh, in some circumstances this is sufficient. So then, then in these cases we will have more than collective long-range control, but maybe collective immediate control. And um, so somebody also su suggested to me a case where, there, uh, where, where we can suppose that Mary is the only expert about water on Twin Earth or the only person who engages in these kind of things. And so everybody just defers to her. 
right? So it might be that she has individual control under these circumstances, maybe. Um, and, and again, I would say, okay, uh, maybe in some cases we have more than collective long-range control, so much the better. Um, so this, the, the idea was just to, to, to say that, I guess, typically we don't have more than a collective long-range control, but collective long-range control uh, suffices to block the externalist challenge. Has a question. This is something like a swamp man question. Um, and I was a little puzzled by your, your response to that earlier. Um, I guess my, my general concern is that I'm not sure what we want from the conceptual engineering. But two kinds of things you might want are more true beliefs and different kinds of behavior. Um, certainly, we can get different kinds of behavior. a bunch of new stuff about the word that's associated with the concept of not change whatever factors are inside the skin that complicate that. No problem, even for change. So we get lots of changes in behavior. But we can also get lots more true to um, This is the part I'm puzzled by here. Mm -hmm. here. Because I, you know, conceptual re-engineering of the concept of disease might get me to stop thinking about disease as a religious concept. Not even causing disease or something, right? So, and by getting me to stop thinking about disease as a religious concept, I can start thinking about it maybe as something that's caused by bacteria or a virus. Right? So I can come to have more true beliefs about disease as a result of conceptual engineering, engineering yeah. without changing the reference of disease at all. Yeah. Just about the own all. So I'm, I'm a little puzzled about that sort of this sense that we lots yeah, so, so I think the, the only view that really threatens my project is the view that it's, uh, conceptual engineering is never about reference change. So if that turns out to be the case, then, uh, so then, then maybe nothing of what I said is wrong, but the whole thing is irrelevant to the project of conceptual engineering. So this, uh, this is, I think, the worst that can happen. Uh, but if you, if you if at least you think that it's, it's sometimes about reference change, and people do phrase conceptual engineering in these ways, they, at least uh, Herman does in his view, uh, in his book, and I think he, you would probably agree that the conceptual engineering at is at least sometimes about reference change, uh, then it's a viable question about reference change can be had, whether it's compatible with semantic externalism. This is a question I've been trying to address. And if now other people tell me that, oh, sometimes it's not about reference change, then then I'm okay with that. So I've just been trying to, to, to deal with this specific project, the project of reference change, and to see how that squares with externalism. So uh, I don't have clear, to be honest, I don't have clear views about whether uh, uh, how often conceptual engineering is about reference change. I think there's such a vast plurality of different projects, and uh, we have yet to see how they all relate and what is the best way to make sense of them. Yeah. But I would, I, I would at least say that it's sometimes about reference change. Because, yeah. I guess my intuition is that it hardly ever is, but I'm not clear about what all we want to change. Yeah. I feel like I want to say something about all of this, but I should sustain from. Okay. Yeah, so I just, I, the first part of the book is all about that, which I give like a hundred examples. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seven. Seven. Um, I want to talk about strategy number three. Um, I thought you did a pretty good example of sketching some externalist theories from Evans and Debbie <coughs> that make kind of long range, long term meaning control and meaning change possible. My worry was that it wouldn't really cover all the cases that we need. I mean, part of the problem is that Devin's and Abbott's theories are both designed for the proper names. And they're designed for terms that refer to specific individuals. And Tal was talking about you know, the dominant, you know, called historical source of your information or your groundings or whatever. And, I, and the thing is, conception engineers aren't trying to conceptually engineer proper names. So it's a little unclear how those, how those kind of theories can translate over to other cases. So, Somebody, one, one problem is cases of conception engineering that don't even involve extension change. So you might think, yeah. um, if people talk about the example queer was brought up earlier, I just have like no idea how to even apply yeah. your model to that. And even in cases where the extension does change, you might think that the particulars that you're running into are the same ones you're running into before. And it seems like maybe you can tell some story about, well, I'm running into the same particular people or individuals but it's like a different property in them which is causing me yeah. to say the term. But I, I mean, I don't know, this, that sounds a little sketchy, maybe it works, but I'm just, I feel like more needs to be said yeah. about a theory that's specifically targeted at names, how it's gonna generalize to all this other stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah
stuff. Yeah, well, that, that, that's a good point. So, um, so I think it applies fairly straightforwardly to the, to the water case I've presented, because again, uh, so what is similar uh, 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 to the case of proper names that there we just have another set of tokens, and we can just fix the term to, to these kinds of tokens, and those tokens will causally ground our thoughts then, and those tokens are different from the tokens that, that were used in the, in the former groundings, right? So if there's, uh, if there's uh, uh, lots of extension overlap, then this becomes much harder. Yeah. It becomes much harder to see how this can work. So, um, so I think the literature about the QA problem might be of help here. Yeah. So, so in the, QA pr the QA problem is the question of how cause theories um, can, um, um, can precisify the sort of indetermination between the different kinds of types that, that every token, token is a paradigm of, which, which of the types is then uh, picked out by the, by the, by the baptism. Uh, and so I think man many people in responding to the QA problem, at least Michael David, and I also think Amy has done this, is uh, appeal to, uh, to uh, mental content. Again, to think it has something to do with the intention of uh, uh, which kind of, which, which, which type uh, 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 ought to be singled out here. So, so you, could, you could, for example, s say, uh, describe maybe the case of gender as a case where uh, for, for, a long term, for, uh, for a long time, people have used women to pick out a, maybe a, a biological kind, and now women are picked out qua social kind in the same with, with men. So maybe as a qua problem, uh, a similar mechanism that is, uh, is, is used to account for the qua problem can be of help here too. So again, I would think that, that hybrid series uh, uh, are probably better off than Krippi's original version here because they have an extra resource to, uh, to account for that. Or we started with this way. Next question. Yes, I'm going to Seven? Oh, you were uh, eight. Oh, maybe that was not. No, 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 I think. You were eight? I think I'm eight, yes. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, we got to. Okay. So, I was wondering if whether your notion of long range collective control was really strong enough for your purposes. So, suppose <coughs> I want to bring about um, global vegetarianism. Nothing less. Than a state in which no one eats meat, everyone has a vegetarian diet over the entire planet will do. Um, now that seems to be under our collective uh, long-range control in your mm -hmm. in your terminology. That is, everyone um, is, is able to gradually reduce their meat consumption until they end up just um, eating So, um, global vegetarianism is under a long-range collective control, but that by itself is not a very good argument for saying, well, okay, so, you know, I just need to raise enough money and this is a, worth, this is a worthwhile project to do, you know, Bill Gates gives me a million dollars and I should plow this into the project of trying to bring about global vegetarianism. It's never going to happen, or at any rate, it's never going to happen that way. So don't you need something, something stronger? If you're, if you're trying to fend off the objection that, uh, look, conceptual engineering is just a waste of time because it's never going, never going to work, it's not feasible, Yeah. then you need something stronger than your notion. So I'm not sure, because so, so, so for one, many people engage in uh, advocating vegetarianism. Many people are actually trying to make uh, many people uh, uh, stop eating meat, right? So it seems that the, uh, the idea that it is so, so hard typically doesn't undermine uh, normative projects, even about vegetarianism. So no, nobody said, you know, you can't, you can't change what people eat, so you shouldn't try. No, people think you should uh, try to do that. And uh, Yeah, you certainly can yeah. um, increase the number of vegetarians. That's totally feasible. But what I'm thinking of is where my, my, my goal... So suppose I think, look, morally it doesn't matter whether one animal is, is eaten or a million animals. Morally, it's all the same. The only thing that matters is the difference between some people eating meat and no one, uh, no one eating meat at all. That's my sole goal. Yeah, yeah. Then 
that is under our collective long range control, but still it's a waste of time trying to yeah, yeah. bring it out. Okay, yeah, fair point. So, um, well, I think the situation is a bit better in the uh, uh, in the conceptual engineering case. So, because for one, you don't need to change what everybody in the world does, um, because uh, the, commu the the relevant communities in question are much smaller than that. And also, you need to you, you don't need to change what everybody has as a, their causal sources or something. You just need a sufficient amount. And maybe difference plays its role. So, some people matter more than others, or what, whatever. So, so I think there are a number of factors that make it a bit more viable, right, than, than the, the global vegetarian case. But apart from that, uh, I agree that the, the outcome will be that it often doesn't work and that it's very, very hard to, to do that. And it, is, uh, it requires lots of uh, stamina and stuff like that. But um, I thought, so the way I constructed the externalist challenge was that, it, that there are some very principled meta-semantic reasons that undermine the whole, the whole project. You know, is the externalist challenge it's just that it's very difficult because it requires doing so many things that are difficult to achieve. Uh, I agree with that. That that is probably the case. Um, but yeah. So the way I, I construed the challenge was that it's more dramatic than that, even more dramatic than that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, follow up on this. I mean, one of the things. I was thinking about another concern. Well, I have to borrow from Ray Kinsella. Like, there is one thing that doesn't mean feasible. And so if you had an off implies feasibility principle in the background, switching to collective long range control would get you this for the kinds of reasons you can hear. Um, if off implies can, then you can say, yeah, you still like to claim everyone should be vegetarian, and this is possible, or whatever. So it seems to me like what you want is something more like not necessarily a feasibility constraint and not and something more than that. So something different than that, and like it's a much more specific type of feasibility or the kind of difficulty involved, and that would then help you with explaining why the case of the conceptual stuff is different than this. Um, but it's, it's somehow like more practical or more feasible than like the highly idealized claims yeah. that you don't want. But putting, figuring out where that bar is is going to be tricky. Yeah. The feasibility isn't quite the right bar. I'm not sure. I mean, feas feasibility in itself is not a very precise notion, I guess. So there's practical feasibility, or maybe there's something like metaphysical feasibility. So, so I think I did more than, than, than showing metaphysical feasibility, if something like that exists. So uh, the, the, the idea was to provide a course of, actually a course of action, which people can take, not just in some possible world, but actual human beings can take, that will, uh, work, that will make it the case that reference changes. So. Um, yeah. So maybe. So I think I had this odd implies can principle on one on one slide. Maybe that was not a good a good choice to to phrase it in terms of odd implies can. Um, in terms of climate change example, a lot of people think the thing that you outlined there is completely not feasible, and despite the fact that it's more like a voluntary range control, and one of the reasons it's criticized is for not being feasible. So you might think the relevant notion in the discussion there suggests that if the notion of feasibility is a more particular notion than just the practical feasibility as such. Um, the way that plays out in the climate change. Okay. We'd have to think about that. Okay, I think we're going to thank the speaker.